You're watching the Clean Commercial Transportation Update, and I'm Alicia Gildy. And I'm Bill Van Amberg, and we are staying COVID safe so that we can bring these reports to you. CCTU provides the latest information on technology trends, industry updates, and emerging developments in the clean transportation industry. And the heart of CCTU is really about connecting people and partners by highlighting real progress and groundbreaking collaborations that are driving communities, fleets, and industry faster to a clean air future. Make sure to join us for our upcoming broadcast on Friday, February 19th and Friday, March 19th at 11 a.m. Pacific. And starting in April, we'll return to our weekly schedule. Please register for CCTU. It's really easy to do. Visit our website at calstart.org slash cctupdate. And we'll CCTU soon. Sooner than you thought, we will CCTU. Hi, everybody. Welcome again. It's great to have you back with us for this February 19th edition of the Clean Commercial Transportation Update, CCTU. I'm Bill Van Amberg. And I'm Alicia Gildy, and together we're your hosts for the next half hour of news, trends, and updates about our industry's progress. Brought together by our fantastic team, our producer, Casey Okasaki, Alex Gaddis is running the controls, and Whitley Porter is steering all of our communications. Alicia, it's so great to be back together with everybody, and we have a lot to share today on our industry. But as we start, let's just take a moment to recognize a few challenges and, and some breakthroughs. First, of course, our hearts really go out to our friends, colleagues, uh, and the people of Texas. The Arctic freeze and snow has been devastating to millions of people. Many just got their power back yesterday. Some still don't have power. You and I both have family in Texas, Alicia. Uh, Bill, we do. It's been so troubling to see the pictures of Texas under ice, my home state. These extreme weather events like firestorms in California, in Australia, the super typhoons and hurricanes, all are a part of the instability driven by climate change. We must use these events to pull together, support smart rebuilding and redouble our work to reduce climate impacts really brings it home so true. But if our hearts go out to Texas, at least our spirit soars to Mars this week. How exciting was it with the Mars, the latest Mars rover, the Perseverance landed safely yesterday after its journey to the red planet, touching down at a site that scientists believe may help us further scout signs of past life on that planet. And a big thumbs up to our friends at the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, near us here in Pasadena. We're proud to say a member of CalSTART where mission control for all these missions are based. Very exciting. Oh, so exciting. I loved that, Bill. <laughs> well, and finally, our souls are enriched by Black History Month where we recognize some milestones for America in 2021. Most notably, of course, is Kamala Harris, the first woman, first African-American and first person of South Asian descent to be vice president. And importantly for our industry, Michael Regan is on track to be confirmed as our first black man to lead the Environmental Protection Agency. Bill, these are all wonderful steps forward. They really are. And, and part of what we do on CCTU is to share this kind of progress. And there is a lot to share about our industry today, Alicia. So let's write, let's get into our rundown. What a, it's really packed. It sure is. Uh, Bill, we have our friend Mike Roth of the North American Council of Freight Efficiency joining us to talk about their Run On Less Electric campaign, which seeks to feature performance of zero emission trucks in the field. And keeping in theme with zero emission vehicles, CalSTART's project manager, John Jackson, will highlight a great report that presents the growing expansion of zero emission bus deployments throughout the United States. We'll also have our policy uh, leaders, our directors, uh, Meredith Alexander and Kyle Winslow joining us to talk about both our California Policy Summit coming up, uh, very exciting, where we've actually got the uh, governor of California speaking, as well as look at what's happening in DC and joining us for that to further expand with her knowledge will be Lynn Haquez, the principal from CJ Lake, who has been our advisor for nearly three decades. So we've got a lot to cover. Uh, but first, let's find out from people what those priorities are for DC. Well, that's right, Bill. You know we love our polls, so let's bring it up. Thank you, Alex. All right, with the new administration in place, what should be the top priorities for transportation? Our options are target infrastructure investments. Secondly, focus regulation and investments on speeding zero emission technology. 
Third, provide more transport options to underserved communities. And then lastly, set a national carbon neutral goal and timeline for the nation. Boy, all good priorities. Yep. Uh, it, with this Congress, it's gonna be hard to see what can be done, but the, this new administration has done a lot with executive orders out of the gate. Yes, they have. All right, Alex, let's see what people have been saying. It right, looks like the top option here in terms of importance is target infrastructure investments, I would say followed by focusing regulation and investments on speeding zero emission technology. All right, great. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Bill, over to you and our industry news rundown. Well, you bet. And we'll be talking more about those uh, policy updates later. Uh, we lead off with one. President Biden used one of his executive orders to really signal where is the U.S. government going in terms of electrifying its fleet. He has has committed to a broad expansion of electrification in the U.S. fleet and putting billions of dollars into that transition. It's interesting, the U.S. government actually operates about 645,000 vehicles. That's a lot of orders for U.S. made zero emission technology. Ford has signaled that it's uh, got a major transition underway as well. They have committed that they will be 100% zero emission or electric drive vehicles in Europe by 2030. They've also committed to a really fast time frame for their commercial vehicles. That's for light duty. Even on commercial vehicles, they expect in Europe, two thirds of them to be plug-in electric vehicles by 2030. That is a big bar that they have raised. Amazon has taken deliveries of some of their first Rivian electric drive delivery trucks. They're in the city of Los Angeles for their first market. Uh, very exciting to see this, uh, this member of CalStart uh, creating this great vehicle. They're focused on the light duty market with pickups as well as delivery. And Amazon and Rivian say that they may deliver as many as 10,000 of these just over the next uh, few months. Navistar has uh, signaled uh, that they're also joining into the fuel cell hunt. Uh, a number of other truck makers and uh, partners have done this, but GM and Navistar have teamed up to bring the fuel cells that uh, GM is using for their light duty operations and bringing them into heavy duty class eight trucks for Navistar. Joining other powerhouses in the industry such as Daimler and Volvo, who have previously teamed up on fuel cells and also Hino and uh, Toyota, among others. We're also seeing though that battery electric trucks continue to show uh, a lot of drive forward and Scania out of Europe, part of the VW uh, truck and bus group called Trayton has signaled that they think they can get to long range electric trucks operating on what we call uh, the long haul or uh, the, the longer haul operations to be pure battery electric. They think they can get to ranges of uh, several hundred miles carrying what we would say in the United States is an 80,000 pound load and be able to do this and then refuel every time the driver needs to take their rest break. So they've become very bullish on electric drive for long distance technologies, very exciting. We're also seeing that the utilities in the United States are really entering into the space of trying to figure out how to finance uh, and support not just infrastructure, but also the planning and the acquisition of electric drive vehicles. Next Era Energy and Duke Energy via their new eTrans Energy Group are both weighing into this space. Uh, very exciting and Next Era Energy has done a couple of other things recently. They've even acquired a California firm uh, to be able to help them with helping fleets transition and plan for the types of vehicles to acquire. So Proterra is uh, also stepping up its game. We know of them from the bus marketplace, but Proterra has recently put in a new battery manufacturing facility in Los Angeles, not just to support buses, but also to support other commercial vehicles such as trucks. And then just recently with Komatsu have signaled that they will be making a full battery electric, fairly large size excavator using battery packs provided by Proterra, very exciting. Finally, a California company called Monarch, which is up in the Livermore area, has announced not just an electric tractor for field work and agriculture, but one that could be autonomous and also could serve as not only a recharge point, but a data point, pulling information from other equipment out in the farm field. Really exciting. They're looking at how they can develop also a four wheel drive version of this, and then eventually larger and smaller platforms. So we're seeing that push towards zero emissions moving into many platforms, Alicia. 
Oh, Bill, that's so exciting. And thank you so much for that great rundown. So many great developments, certainly in the focus of advancing zero emission technologies. Keeping in spirit of that, I am so excited to bring on our first guest, who is our colleague, John Jackson, who's a project manager at CalSTART. John, zeroing in on zero emission buses. First of all, congratulations to you and the team for this great report. Tell us, what are the main takeaways you found in the research and why are they important? I appreciate you having me on, Alicia and Bill. And, uh, you know, I would say the main takeaways from this report would definitely be really just the overall growth that we saw in the market. It's been fairly consistent. Uh, we saw 2,790 ZEBs this year, which is about a 24% increase from last year. Um, and while this might be a bit down compared to our 33% from 2019, um, you really have to factor in everything that's happened with the pandemic. Um, and it's really astonishing that these buses are still a priority for agencies. I mean, all across, the uh, all across the country, especially with this, how agencies have had to prioritize their budgets differently. And I think the other main takeaway would be just the breakout of zero emission small and airport buses. Um, breaking these out for the first time that we've done this in this series was really important to really understanding the purposes and uses of these zero emissions buses, uh, particularly in the usage of on-demand response and first and last mile gap services and or airport transport services. And you know, this can be found with many of the grants that these buses were purchased with. Hey, John, so I, I think this is so interesting. With the COVID slowdown, we still saw some really strong strength remain in that zero emission sector for transit. Uh, if we could drill down, what did you learn about the reasons for this continued momentum? Why did people keep their order flow going for the zero emission uh, platforms? Well, as we've seen, Bill, you know, the pandemic has really um, it's disrupted many aspects of just transit in general. Um, one of those really big ridership but many of these agencies have had these plans really in the books for years and they're not going to let you know essentially a pandemic you know stop that momentum and the goal of purchasing the number of buses needed to achieve these goals of being full zero emissions one day and climate change isn't letting up you know even in a pandemic as we've seen in parts of this country um, alone this week um, and these vehicles play an important part in fighting that and now that doesn't mean that it's time to slow down and just completely halt that because we're going through a pandemic. You know, we really expect to see these numbers, even though they're down just a little bit in terms of percentage growth, really increase once the economy recovers um, from the pandemic in 2022 and 2023. John, I'm so proud of you. Uh, great work. I uh, just want to acknowledge that a link has been provided in chat. Thank you, Casey. So everyone, please check out this great report. So John, I realize that this is going to be an ongoing process for the team. Tell us what are the big next steps? So the big next steps, Alicia, um, really, I guess, in, in the immediate future is going to be the development of an international ZEBS report that we're doing um, in collaboration with our Drive to Zero miss, you know, initiative. Um, right now, we're looking at really just the United States um, and Canada, but we have, you know, with this, you know, with this international report, we want to expand to Europe and also into Asia. Uh, so we're hoping to start that work, hopefully, you know, in the next month. Um, and then we're gonna be starting our prep work for 2021 with our report. We wanna start a lot earlier than we did last year. Uh, we are really understanding the amount of time and the amount of effort and the amount of research that goes into this report, um, especially with how we've expanded it from the last two years. So we're hoping to start that, I would say in late spring. Um, but most of all, we need your help. We need help from the industry in terms of making sure that these numbers are not only just verified, but very much factual. And, you know, we do a lot of on the ground research, which is reaching out to OEMs and reaching out to state DOTs and then pulling information from grants and from press releases. Um, but all the help we can get to make these reports, you know, as accurate as possible. We love it and we appreciate it. Great, John, thanks so much for joining us today and really encourage people, as Alicia said, to check out that report. It's available uh, on our website and through a link to uh, a transit website that we support for FTA. So thank you very much, John. Well, we see the momentum going in buses. Let's transition now over to the momentum that's really growing for electrified trucks. You know, last broadcast, we featured a news item on the run on less electric program. And today 
we brought in our guest and, and an old friend of mine and colleague from over the years, Mike Roth, Executive Director of the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, or NACFI, as we like to say. Mike, great to have you here with us. Yeah, it's great to be here, uh, Bill. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Hey, you know, so the Run On Less Electric program um, is going to feature these electric demonstrations with fleets. But what is, what's the goal of the program and how are you rolling it out? Yeah, so the I mean the basic objective of Run On Less Electric is to um, is to do this. We're going to reveal how electric trucking works in the present day, so here in 2021, but also its prospects for the future, because things are happening really fast, right? And, and, and involvement and, uh, and pro progress and better trucks and better charging and all that. Uh, but the actual run uh, will have us following ten, uh, maybe more, and we're actually doing better than I expected. We'll follow 10 real world electric trucks over the course of three weeks in September of this year. And so that'll be the core, but, but the effort is really an 18 month uh, ordeal. So we'll, we'll start with uh, education boot camp. Uh, that's 10 events that will go from April to August. Uh, and then there will be a lot of engagements, hopefully in person at events during uh, the, the month of the other run. And then after that, so, the big deal, though, is the run itself. Three weeks during September where one of my team members said it's a real world case studies kind of coming to life on electric trucks. Mike, uh, this is so exciting. I can't wait to check out this boot camp lineup. Uh, I will definitely be tuning in for that. So NACFI has been a great partner organization and leader for driving higher efficiency for freight technology. Tell us why the focus on the testing of zero emission trucks in the field. Why is this important to NACFI? Yeah, so NACFI has this run on less, you know, I call it a run on less brand. Um, you know, it's an addition to the other work we do and we do it every other year. So you have it exactly right. In the first two runs, we looked at efficiency. So this was tires and aerodynamics and all those things. And so in 2017, we did long haul and, and they put up 10.1 mile per gallon. Um, better than I thought. And then in 2019, we focused on regional hall, those return to base, and they, uh, the nine diesels there did 8.7. Um, and so when we looked at 2021 and electric trucks emerging, um, you know, I was pretty hesitant. So was the team looking at electric trucks because run on less is real freight, real trucks, real drivers, you know, uh, real routes. And there's just not that many electric trucks. But as we saw the you know, the act rule and saw the progress being made with trucks and so forth, we thought, no, it does need to happen now. And let's be bold and go make it happen. And right now the planning is going a little bit better than I thought. So um, yeah, it's exciting. Hey, Mike, uh, we're short on time, but let, real quick, how can fleets, what do you hope they take away from it and how can they get involved if they want to? So it's going to be a you know event with the boot camp and then with the dashboard and all that um, and telling these stories about these fleets. So um, you know follow us on RunOnLess.com. We'll uh, we'll also be putting out newsletters and that sort of thing. So so the key point is just getting involved. And then in the fall, if we're actually out and being able to go to to these shows, I mean uh, you know basically around September we're going to be at five or six events from Act Expo in Long Beach through NACV in Atlanta and have Cleveland with TMC now and so those um, you know physical places you know if you're able and safe and and uh, that would be great for you encouraged to go there but the entire run on less electric is it was virtual before virtual was a thing so uh, <laughs> you know you, you can sit at home and and, and do the boot camp um, watch the trucks we'll bring it to life um, right through right through the computer. Great. Right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. It was great to have you on. We are looking forward to more updates from you. Uh, so thank you so much. And it was great being able to highlight this great campaign. We Happy to do it. Supporting it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, now joining us is Meredith Alexander from CalStart, our policy director who's leading the Driving California Forward Policy Summit set to take place next week. We want you all there, everybody, February 23rd and 24th. <laughs> Meredith, first, it's wonderful to hear that you got Governor Newsom signed up to participate for our program next week and additional leaders from the Capitol in, Pasadena, uh, in Sacramento, excuse me. <laughs> uh, tell us a little bit more about the leaders we expect to see at the summit. Thanks, Alicia. Well, you're close. We do have some legislators who are our neighbors uh, down south in Pasadena. So um, we are lucky to have um, Governor Newsom keynoting the second day of the policy summit, um, as well as Commissioner Monahan um, from the Energy Commission. 
and we have the two new female transportation committee chairs for the California legislature, which is just so incredible. Um, we have assembly member Laura Friedman and Senator Lena Gonzalez. We also have some great environmental justice advocates in the Capitol joining us, Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia and Assemblymember Christina Garcia, as well as Assemblymember Phil Ting, who chairs the California Budget Committee and has been a real advocate um, for electric vehicles. So we're just thrilled about uh, their excitement to join our policy summit. Well, that's, it is really a powerful lineup and, and a, a great testament to the work that we've been doing and you've been doing, Meredith. But So what do you want as the, uh, the big takeaways and outcomes, and what policies in particular will the summit really hone in on? Thanks, Bill. So driving California forward, which is what we're now calling the policy summit, is really going to focus on those policy drivers needed to reduce California's transportation emissions, um, you know, finally make a real impact on the state's largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and also specifically what policies we need to adopt to achieve the really ambitious new targets for zero emission vehicles that are laid out in Governor Newsom's executive order. So we're really going to go through each of those goals one by one and talk about what a pathway to achieving them will look like. Uh, Meredith, that's great. And I understand that we're going to have a number of folks tuning in from around the U.S., which is really wonderful. What might mm -hmm. policymakers from across the country be taking away from this summit? Well, I think as we, many of us know, you know, states across the country are adopting and or in the process of adopting ambitious targets like California for zero emission cars and trucks and buses. Um, so I think this will provide them a great preview. You know, California is a number of years ahead of most other states on our policies. And I think they'll really get a great preview of what boots on the ground looks like for achieving these goals and all the different elements that are going to go into making those um, zero emission vehicle goals possible. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it was brief, but uh, I know you also have to get back to making sure this really comes off the way we want in the next two days, a powerful Driving California Forward Summit. Thank you so much for joining us, Meredith. Yeah, Let's, uh, thanks. Hope to see everyone next week. <laughs> yes, we will, we will drive that turnout. Well, uh, that's at the state <laughs> level and obviously really trying to drive those policies. But we're seeing a real intersection of these policies now having an opportunity at the federal level. And I think uh, one of the things we really want to look at is really the exciting work that's gone on as it pertains to our industry, Alicia, with some of the executive orders that, that President Biden has already put out and some of the actions underway. I mean, we talked about the federal fleet, but look at this array of other executive orders. It's really quite powerful. It is, Bill, and it's so exciting and, and great to see this come right out the gate as soon as they came into the office. So that we're seeing an executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, an executive order on the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, a memorandum on restoring trust in government through scientific integrity and evidence-based policymaking, an executive order on protecting public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the climate crisis. And then lastly, I'm so glad to hear about this is rejoining the Paris Agreement, uh, which is critical in terms of our leadership around the world. Yeah, and, and one of the other things that's really, if we can go to the next slide, it's been really intriguing is putting the right people in place to actually get this work done. And we, we don't have to read all of these names off, but there are people in there who, uh, who know how to get this job done, who have been very involved in, in fact, a couple of past EPA administrators are taking additional high level roles in this administration. Let's, let's kind of tackle that uh, and, and talk about it. We've got with us uh, some great guests who will kind of give us a sense of what is really going on, what's the state of play when it comes to uh, Washington, D.C. right now. We have our federal policy director, Kyle Winslow, and Lynn Haquez, the principal at C.J. Lake, who has really been our advisor for, Lynn, gosh, it's been almost 30 years and tracking the changes in D.C. So we want to kind of engage both of you in this conversation, but Lynn, maybe I can talk to you because I've stolen a line from you that I really like, and that is, Personnel is policy. So when we look at these appointments, uh, we look at these executive orders, what does this signal uh, about where the Biden administration is going to be going? 
Well, I think clearly it just demonstrates, especially the level and the number of day one executive orders that dealt with, you know, climate and transportation emissions to some extent, as well as the appointment um, that this is a significant priority for the administration. And even the creation of the uh, Climate Council at the White mm -hmm. House level, traditionally there have been the Domestic Policy Council, National Security Council, and the National Economic Council, but creating a climate specific council with a transportation deputy director and senior policy advisor specifically on that uh, demonstrates a lot. We also see that, um, that a high premium is placed on experience, mm -hmm. government experience, subject matter experience, and diversity. So um, the one thing that we do know is that there, there is a, a specialist, if you will, embedded in every agency, particularly the Department of Transportation for the first time has a climate uh, deputy policy assistant secretary in the policy office to specifically coordinate transportation, clean transportation initiatives. So uh, it really demonstrates the, um, the priority and attention that the administration is paying to this issue. Oh, Lynn, that is fantastic. Thank you so much and great to have you on. All right, uh, Kyle, uh, tell us what are the big ticket items and what do we expect to see them move as well as why is it important to our industry? Thanks, Alicia. Good to be here um, with you all. And um, yeah, a couple of big, big legislative um, packages that we're tracking kind of all simultaneously. So the first would be this um, $1.9 trillion um, uh, relief or rescue plan. I think it's American Rescue Plan is the title that the White House has, has kind of given it. And so this is, you know, your recovery um, from COVID, um, the next kind of bite at that apple, um, which would include the necessary assistance to states, localities, um, you know, the paychecks, um, stimulus paychecks, uh, but also some transit relief that will be included in there. So that's kind of the first hurdle that Congress needs to get through immediately. Um, the White House is out there selling that now pretty aggressively. And that's moving through budget reconciliation, which is just a wonky way of saying it's 51 vote threshold in the Senate. So that will um, pr probably see a um, quick pack passage in the March timeframe. The second would be this larger stimulus package, which could be multi-trillion dollar package after um, after the March timeframe, really immediately after we might start seeing pieces kind of being socialized, but with package um, not really being acted on until later, potentially in the spring or even summer. And this um, would be kind of the Build Back Better plan, which would include more ZEV policy um, incentives potentially for light duty and medium heavy duty. It's where we're potentially looking for, for example, to see if there's um, um, a zero emission truck incentive um, yeah. pathway there. Um, if you're familiar with that effort that we're helping to lead. Also some infrastructure and climate um, investments. So a large opportunity there for the industry um, to, to really see some meaningful um, policy um, priority and, and investment. Um, the third really quickly here is the surface transportation um, bills that are continuing really the conversation from last year, which was a you know one year extension um, to this to this year. Now we're here and we, we're seeing the House and transportation infrastructure under Chairman DeFazio really signal a strong interest in getting started quickly. And then last week we even saw um, bipartisan audience uh, of um, Environment and Public Works Committee on the on the Senate side with the new Chairman Carper there um, sitting down with um, President Biden and, and Secretary Buttigieg to kind of show bipartisan support for maybe moving surface transportation through regular order. So we're tracking that for everything from FTA investment in uh, low no zero emission buses, innovative mobility to um, you know freight movement, decarbonizing freight movement. Um, infrastructure for that through corridors and through other um, EVSE investments, for example. So um, and that could get started very early in you know, March here with hearings. And then we're hearing, I think, on the Senate side that they were trying to um, move their version um, by, uh, I think it was Memorial Day. So the other thing was this could tack along, you know, we don't know yet, but it could tag along with um, the Build Back Better kind of stimulus package um, or it could move separately. <laughs> Lot of right. <clears throat> there is there. a there is a lot there, Kyle, and thank you for that. And 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 we have three policy campaigns, major campaigns going at the federal level with Kyle's leadership on trucks, buses, and corridors infrastructure. So if you want to take part in that, please do join in. 
Lynn, I got to keep it real short. If you could give me like a, a 15 second answer, and I hate to do that to you. Okay. When will Biden's priorities that he's signaling with all of this actually make it into budget mechanisms? Is, are we going to see any of that this year or is that really a play for next year? No, I do think we will see some of those priorities this year. Of course, the budget which usually comes out in February is delayed. We're expecting something, a skinny budget in mid-March, but, um, but many of the players uh, that are over at OMB developing this are well familiar. Uh, Shalanda Young, who's deputy director, was staff director of the House Appropriations Committee for our low-no program, for a lot of our zero emission requests. So I do anticipate you will recall that in the Biden budget, right, as part of his platform, he had $1.6 trillion over 10 years for transportation, infrastructure, and our R&D specifically. So we will start to see elements of that as early as next month. Great. Thank you very much. So thank you both for taking part in this. I know it was tight, but boy, you packed a lot of information in a short period of time, which is what we count on from you. Thank you so much and really encourage people to join with us to fight for these changes uh, where there's a real opportunity for it at the federal level. Alicia, should we see what's coming up? Oh, sure, Bill. Uh, let's take a, just a quick second for everybody to check out our policy summit, Driving California Forward next week. Please make sure to register for it. We would love to see you all there. Bill and I are gonna be the MCs of this great program and we can't wait to see you. So check it out. I know Casey's got the link in chat and uh, we'll see you next week. Bill, to you. Great, thanks, Alicia. But of course, once again, the half hour goes by really fast, doesn't it? Our time has come for this edition of CCTU. And thanks so much for joining us. Uh, please take part, as Alicia said, in this exciting policy summit coming up next week. We will be there. And then CCTU will be back in a month on March 19th at this same time. Until then, I'm Bill Van Amberg. On behalf of Alicia Gildy, my great partner, and all of us at CalStart, thank you for joining us. Be extra safe, take care of yourself, and stay connected. We will CCTU again on March 19th.